Hi, my name is First Lieutenant Devin Stevens. I'm an 11 Alpha and infantry officer, and we're here in Donnelly Training Area. In the deep, dense forests of Alaska, a special ops team is on a thrilling mission. They're chasing something unknown, something they can only call it. The trees are tall, the air is cold, when a horrible sound makes their hearts race. What did they hear that made them so terrified? Join us as we uncover the hidden truth that will change the way you think about nature forever. The Chili Mission in Alaska. So training in the Arctic is inherently dangerous because of the weather, the risk of predators, and uh, the possibility of being cut off from our main sources of supply. Back in the chilly month of February 1994, a fellow named Miles led a group of highly skilled soldiers on a hush-hush mission deep in the heart of Alaska's wintry landscape. This wasn't just any training. Known as strategic reconnaissance, this mission required the team to sneak around undetected, gathering important details about what any potential enemies might be up to. They needed to do all this without being spotted, a tough job made even tougher by the freezing conditions. Equipped with cross-country skis and burdened with backpacks loaded with tents, ready to eat meals, and all sorts of gear to keep warm, they were there to sharpen their skills under extreme conditions. The setting was a remote, heavily wooded area to the east of Eelson Air Force Base near Fairbanks. With a challenging three days laid out in front of them, the team of 11 soldiers had to navigate through the rugged terrain. Their path took them up steep ridges, down slopes, and across marshy lowlands, all while maintaining a stealthy presence. As they trudged through this wild, snowy environment, they encountered an especially thick patch of forest. Miles, always thinking ahead, proposed a small exploration to see if they could find a way through or if it would be better to go around. He and two others donned their snowshoes and delved into the dense woods. Deep in the forest, they stumbled upon a surprising find, huge footprints in the snow, each measuring about 18 to 19 inches long with an incredible stride length of about five feet. This discovery was intriguing, to say the least. Curious, they decided to see just how these strides compared to a human's effort in such deep snow. One soldier took off his snowshoes and tried to match the stride. Despite his best efforts, he sank knee deep with each step, managing only a foot and a half compared to the five foot strides of the strange prince. They measured the footprints carefully, noting their clean edges and the absence of any drag marks or disturbed snow around them. This unusual find certainly gave them something to think about as they continued their reconnaissance mission in the silent, snowy wilderness. The team sergeant, who was really good at tracking, took a close look at the large footprints they found in the snow. From the size and depth of these prints, they guessed that whatever made them was huge, about nine feet tall and weighing somewhere between 500 and 700 pounds. This find was so intriguing that the team decided to follow the tracks further, eager to see where they led and learn more about this massive creature. The footprints showed a path that skillfully crossed over mountain ridges, tucked away under the cover of thick trees, and wove through the damp, marshy lowlands. The creature seemed to know how to move quietly and stay out of sight, using tactics similar to those the soldiers were trained in. As the team followed the trail, the daylight began to fade and the cold night air settled in. They stopped to set up their campsite for the night. But after several hours of this, the sun was starting to go down. They thought, let's set up camp and let's uh, hunker down for the night. They got MREs, get the water boiling, have some meals, get in their sleeping bags, do a little reading, relaxing and just, just trying to stay warm and get some rest. Heating up their pre-packaged meals and rolling out their sleeping bags for some rest under the open, starry sky. But the peace was short-lived. At about 4 a.m., Miles was suddenly awakened by a sound that seemed like a wolf howling in the distance. As he lay listening, the howl transformed into a loud, echoing roar that reverberated off the surrounding hills. Then, he heard the distinct noise of something big moving through the forest, getting louder as it neared their camp. The sound stopped abruptly about 100 feet away, and then all was silent. Soon there was the noise of something pacing back and forth, 
snapping branches and rustling through the underbrush. The rest of the soldiers stirred, unzipping their tents to listen more intently to the unsettling sounds. And the best part is yet to come. The strange noises continued for several long minutes before stopping suddenly. Then, a chilling combination of a howl, roar, and scream pierced the night, sending shivers down everyone's spine. They flashed their lights around in the darkness, trying to catch a glimpse of whatever was out there, but saw nothing, realizing they had no ammunition. Since this was a training exercise and not a combat situation, they felt completely vulnerable. Miles decided they would pack up and leave the area as soon as it was light. However, before dawn even broke, another alarming sound shook them, a tree being pushed over. They saw a movement in the treetops, followed by the loud crack of the tree breaking and falling. They hurriedly packed up their gear. Before they left, Miles and another soldier found more large footprints in a spot where it seemed the creature had been moving around a lot. They also discovered a large dead pine tree about 12 inches in diameter and 35 feet tall that had been snapped in half cleanly. As the sun came up and they quickly left, Miles couldn't shake the feeling that their adventure was just beginning. The government map clue. Deciding it was best to keep this whole experience to themselves to avoid any complications or disbelief from others, they agreed not to talk about it. However, Miles couldn't stop thinking about what might have been if they had continued to follow the tracks. Later, Miles had a conversation with Anthony, a neighbor from northeastern Washington, who mentioned the Fairchild Air Force Survival School. They issued topographical maps with survival tips that include a section on dangerous animals, and interestingly, these maps even have an illustration of a Sasquatch. This small piece of official recognition made Miles feel slightly validated in keeping their encounter under wraps. Miles often found himself wondering about the large creature they had tracked. Could it really have been a Sasquatch? The thought lingered in his mind, especially considering the government map seemed to acknowledge such creatures could exist. Sasquatch, often called Bigfoot, is this big hairy creature that some people think lives in the forests of North America, especially in the Pacific Northwest and Western Canada. The word Sasquatch comes from Saskets, which is a term from the sales community that means wild man or hairy man. In many indigenous cultures across North America, this creature is more than just a story. It's part of their heritage. They see it as a protector of the forest and a being that can move between the physical world and the spiritual world. The first time people started talking about Sasquatch in North America was way back in the late 1800s. One of the earliest stories appeared in an 1884 newspaper article from Victoria's British colonist, which talked about the capture of a creature half-man, half-beast near Yale, British Columbia. They named it Jacko, and described it as looking a lot like a gorilla with lots of thick black hair. Even though people still debate whether this story was true, it sparked a lot of interest in this creature. In the 1900s, more stories started popping up. For instance, in 1924 near Mount St. Helens, miners said they were attacked by giant apes. These stories made the newspapers, and more and more people became interested in Sasquatch. By the 1950s, people started calling it Bigfoot. This happened after some loggers in California found really big footprints near Bluff Creek. The name Bigfoot came from a newspaper article in 1958 that talked about these footprints. Even though there have been lots of sightings and stories, no one has solid proof that Sasquatch really exists. People who say they've seen it describe it as a very tall, two-legged creature covered in dark hair, anywhere from 6 to 15 feet tall. Some say it smells bad and has glowing eyes. There have been footprints found that are super big, like 24 inches long and 8 inches wide, but a lot of these have been proven to be fake. One of the most famous pieces of evidence is the Patterson-Gimlin film from 1967. It shows what looks like a big, hairy figure walking through the woods in Bluff Creek, California. Some people think this video is real proof of Bigfoot, but others say it's just a person in a costume. Sasquatch isn't just a spooky story, it's a big part of popular culture too. It's been in lots of books, movies, and TV shows. Take the 1987 movie Harry and the Hendersons, for example. It shows Sasquatch as a friendly giant 
who becomes part of a human family, which is a nicer way to think about this creature. Stay tuned to find out more about this. There are all kinds of legends about Sasquatch in Native American culture. For the salespeople, seeing a Sasquatch means you're in the right place at the right time. The Haida people have a story about Gagixid, a wild man who turns into a supernatural being after getting lost in the forest. The Coast Salish people talk about Semequis, creatures that roam the forest at night. Even without scientific proof, the story of Sasquatch continues to live on, thanks to countless stories from people who say they've seen it and the cultural significance it holds. Some researchers think Sasquatch could be a leftover from an ancient type of big ape that came over from Asia to North America a long time ago, but there's no fossil proof of this. Nowadays, Sasquatch represents all the things we don't know and are still trying to figure out. Groups like the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization keep looking for evidence and collecting stories. While lots of people are skeptical, thinking the sightings are just misidentified animals or made up stories, the legend of Sasquatch keeps hanging on as one of the most interesting stories in North America. The stories Miles heard from Anthony made him even more curious about these legends pulling him deeper into a world of wonder and questions. The heart of Sales land. The Sales, known too as the Chehalis First Nation, are a part of the Coast Salish group and live in the lower mainland area of British Columbia, Canada. The name Sales comes from the Halkamalam language and means the beating heart. This name shows their strong connection to their land and reflects their cultural values. For as long as anyone can remember, the Sales people have a history filled with deep traditions and stories. One of their oldest tales is about an Indian doctor named Shay who lived near Harrison Lake. He fought a powerful being called Zalos. After winning against Shay, Zalos threw Shay's heart towards the rivers, and where it landed, the ground throbbed like a heart, which is how their area got its name. The Sales community has a deep bond with their territory which stretches from Harrison River to Harrison Lake. They're well known for keeping their traditions alive through storytelling, fishing, and holding ceremonies. They've also put a lot of effort into keeping their language, Halkamalem, alive by using it in everyday life, teaching it in schools, and in their government. Speaking of government, the Sitsales run their community based on their traditional laws and the belief in governing themselves. They have various committees that take care of different areas like justice, the environment, and managing natural resources. The leaders of the community, the chief and the council, make sure the Sales rights and claims to their lands are honored and protected. One big achievement for the Sales was a reconciliation agreement they reached with the British Columbia government. This deal helps them reach their goals in society, culture, economy, and taking care of the environment. It included giving the community 167 hectares of land along the Chihalas River financial aid to help govern themselves, and support for projects in tourism, recreation, and caring for the environment. This agreement is a big step in building a stronger bond between the Sun Sales and the provincial government, choosing to work together rather than being in conflict. Education is really important to the Sun Sales. They have their own school where kids learn the usual subjects, but also their traditional crafts like basket weaving, fishing, and wood carving. These classes help keep their cultural knowledge alive and pass it down to the kids. They also support their members in getting higher education and training after school. The sales are also very focused on taking care of the environment and using their traditional knowledge in modern ways. They maintain forest gardens and other natural resources, showing their lasting relationship with their land and their commitment to living sustainably. And there's more to the story than just this. In terms of health and social services, the community has made big strides. They've set up the Tel Mexwaltek Abu Healing Center, offering various health and wellness programs. They're also planning to build a primary health care center with help from the provincial government. Sales cultural tours and events play a big part in sharing their heritage with others. These tours and events give people a look into their history, traditions, and the beautiful nature of their lands. The community is very active in these cultural events making sure their traditions and stories stay alive and strong. The Sales have a long history of facing challenges and fighting for their rights. 
They've been involved in legal actions and negotiations to defend their land and cultural heritage. The recent reconciliation agreement shows years of hard work and opens a hopeful way forward. The sales community is a strong example of resilience, cultural pride, and a deep bond with their land. They continue to respect their past while looking for new chances to grow and develop. With their self-governance, educational efforts, and commitment to the environment, the sales are building a future that respects their history and supports their goals for independence and well-being. Now, let's get to know stories about strange creatures all around the world, revealing a fascinating and widespread belief. Along a road, the guy I was with was about 60 feet away. And at about 2.30 a.m., something comes walking down the road. I see something. Bigfoot around the world. Around the globe, every culture seems to have its own version of a big hairy creature, similar to Bigfoot. These creatures, though they might look a lot alike, are woven deeply into the unique stories and backgrounds of the places they're from. In Indonesia, there's a creature called the Orang Pendek. It's a bit like a small, strong ape and lives in the thick jungles of Sumatra. Uh, Orang Pendek means short person in Indonesian. This creature isn't as tall as Bigfoot, usually just three to five feet high, but it's known for being very strong. Both locals and even some scientists have claimed to see it. There have been many trips into the jungle trying to find real proof of the Orang Pendek, but all that's been found so far are some footprints and handprints. Over in Brazil, there's a legend about the map and Godwari, especially in the Amazon rainforest. This creature is said to smell really bad and scream loudly. What the map and Gwari looks like can vary a lot. Some say it looks like a giant sloth, and others think it looks more like an ape. Some stories even say it has a mouth on its stomach, or just one eye in the middle of its forehead. These wild, varied descriptions make some people think it's more of a myth, but people still report seeing it. In Australia, the local version of Bigfoot is called the Yowie. According to Aboriginal legends, the Yowie could be anywhere from 6 to 12 feet tall, with long arms and orangey-brown hair. People have reported seeing it all over Australia, especially in Queensland and New South Wales. The Yowie is usually shy, but it can also be aggressive. Aboriginal cave paintings show tall, hairy figures, suggesting that the Yowie has been a part of local stories for a very long time. North America has its fair share of Bigfoot-like legends too. Native American tribes like the Ojibwe and the Dakota have tales about a creature called the Rugaru, or the Big Man. This creature is seen as a protector or messenger, appearing during important times of danger or change. Its visits are highly respected and considered significant in these communities. But wait, there's still more to it. Moving over to the Himalayas, you find the Yeti, or the Abominable Snowman. It's supposed to live in the snowy mountains and looks like a big, ape-like creature with white or gray fur. The local stories say the Yeti protects the mountains. Interest from the West in the Yeti grew a lot in the 20th century, sparking many expeditions. Despite all the effort, no one has found clear proof yet. In Mongolia, there's a similar creature known as the Almaz. It looks a bit more human than the others, covered in reddish-brown hair. The Almas is unique because it sometimes interacts with people, according to local stories. Reports and tales about the Almas have kept it alive in the folklore of the area. These stories from around the world show how fascinated humans are with the unknown. Despite the differences in appearance and nature, these creatures all share traits like large footprints, a lot of hair, and a knack for staying just out of reach. They're not just simple tales. They're important parts of cultural heritage, enriching the folklore of their respective regions and showing our universal curiosity about what might be lurking in the unexplored corners of our planet. Is it just a figment of overactive imaginations, or could there be something lurking in the Alaskan wilderness that the world has yet to discover? What do you think is really going on? Share your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more.